So my name is Simo Tönen, yeah, the manager of trade policy and market operations at Waterfine Australia. I'm sure by now you're all wondering where's that weird accent from. Uh, the answer is Finland. We certainly don't have water markets in Finland because our rivers are frozen for a good chunk of the year. But we certainly have water markets here in Australia. And for those who don't know who Waterfine Australia is, uh, just a brief introduction. We are Australia's leading uh, water broker, and our core business is to run an online platform uh, that facilitates both temporary and permanent trading uh, across Australia. So from that point of view, uh, today I'm talking about the role that water markets have played in the effective utilization of a scarce resource, uh, which water without a doubt is in Australia, and how water markets have matured in order to make this happen. So as we all know, the climate in Australia is extremely variable as these pictures from Lake Eildon in the Goulburn catchment in Victoria exemplify. In a drought-prone country like Australia, it is critical that we have a price on water which reflects its true value. The whole basic principle behind water markets is that uh, uh, they improve economic outcomes through supply and demand providing, by providing price signals uh, that allow water to flow to its highest value use and encourage investment in, in water use efficiencies. And in general, support redistribution of water resources to areas where they will be used the most productively. So when we're thinking about the role that water markets have played in, in the effective utilization of this scarce resource, it can be stated without a doubt that water markets are a core component of uh, effective water management in Australia. A prime example of that was uh, seen during the millennium drought. Uh, during the drought, water markets sustained Australian irrigators through many years of record low rainfalls. Not only did markets uh, help to preserve a financial future for, for many farmers, but they actually helped to maintain the value of irrigated agricultural production during the drought. As we can see here in the, in the Murray-Darling Basin, from uh, season 2005-2006 to 07-08, the amount of water used by irrigators fell by 57%. However, the value of irrigated production only fell by 8%, which is simply remarkable. And it can be mostly attributed to uh, the combination of utilizing water markets and irrigation efficiencies. There are some more recent examples as well, not just the Millennium Drought. For instance, uh, as we can see here, the water use, the water availability dropped 25% from 2013-14 to 14-15. But the irrigated production only fell by 2.4%. And also, if we compare the, the uh, uh, production levels, 14-15 to pre-drought levels in 05 06 we can see that the production is 26% above the pre-drought levels, using 20% less water, which goes to show how much more efficient irrigators and water users have become through the utilization of, of water markets. And it also shows how the market has matured as uh, water users, they manage their water resources uh, throughout each season in a strategic manner. Well, even though I said that uh, during the Millennium Drought we saw prime examples how, how uh, the, market, the water market supported irrigators, when we talk about maturing markets, we have to remember that during that time the water markets were still fairly immature. Uh, and we have an example of that here. Uh, the highlighted area there, that is the uh, uh, declared systems in Northern Victoria, uh, zones one to nine, including high trading, high water use areas of Vic Goulburn and Vic Murray. Uh, the blue bars on the right, uh, they compare the net available water uh, uh, for the entitlements in this area uh, at the peak of the drought, 07, 08, to 2014-15. As we can see, the net water availability was almost 60% less in 07, 08 compared to 14-15. However, the yellow bars on the left, it showed that actually at the peak of the drought, more water was written off at the end of the season, uh, both in terms of absolute megaliters and also as a percentage of net available water. Uh, so more water was written off at the end of 07, 08 than 14, 15. And by written off, I mean water that at the end of the year, it wasn't used by irrigators, it wasn't traded, it 
wasn't or could, couldn't be carried over. It was just sitting on the accounts and was basically wasted. The conclusion of this is that at that time, water right holders were not as educated to make the best decisions to manage their water assets. Who knows, they might not have even heard that water trading exists or that water has any value. And at that point, the value was really significant. In fact, uh, in the Southern Connected system, it was at, at all time high. It peaked at $1,200 per megaliter, and that's for temporary water. So potentially, a lot of opportunities uh, were lost at that time simply because the markets were still uh, fairly immature. So even though during the drought, water markets sustained Australian irrigators through hard times, the markets were to reach their maturity. And it also goes to show that should a similar drought hit this year, next year, or whenever, we would be able to be much, more, much better prepared uh, and the matured market would support the farmers even better. So what makes all of this possible? How can the, the markets support uh, farmers so well? It all comes down to legislation and the reform of the water management systems in Australia. The topic of this session was uh, adapting to a future with less water. Well, as we can see here, from a water policy point of view, Australia has been adapting uh, to a future with less water for quite some time, all the way from uh, implementing the cap on extraction in the basin in 1997, National Water Initiative 04, Water Act 07, Basin Plan 2012. Without going into great details, uh, detail of this, these major reforms, one key consequence of them was the separation of water from land, which has been an important step in the de development of, of markets to facilitate increasing amounts of trade. Enabled by these key policy reforms, the water markets have matured incrementally on the side, as can be seen on the bottom of this figure. And, and the market mechanisms, they've come a long way from ad hoc over the fence type of trading which was seen in the 1980s and 90s compared to modern online exchanges where water right holders can, for instance, buy water today to get it delivered next season or even the season after that. As a result of these policy reforms and uh, maturing markets, uh, over the past decade, we witnessed the following key components of water market maturity. Firstly, there's greater understanding around water trading, which has been utilized by irrigators to improve their annual returns. Water users are more aware of, of when to trade and, and how to capitalize on the impact of price conditions. And all in all, irrigators, they understand market drivers and they incorporate this, this uh, knowledge into their annual plans and programs. Secondly, uh, Irrigators have seen the value of having a diversified water portfolio. So back in the day, it was very common for the irrigators just to have, just to hold a single entitlement for their, for their home catchment, so to speak, just to the river where they uh, divert the water uh, directly. Uh, however, these days, especially in the, in the Southern Connected system, uh, the irrigators have seen the value of, of managing risks uh, uh, via having a diversified water portfolio, having multiple entitlements, not just your home catchment, but also uh, in other catchments or even in the state. So in the Southern Connected system, this is especially useful because let's say your property is in New South Wales, you can own a South Australian entitlement, Victorian entitlement, and still get the water delivered from those entitlements to your property in, in, in New South. And by doing that, it's possible to, to bypass some, some of the trade limits that may be on the pay, uh, in place and uh, all in all mitigate risk uh, around the market and, and water uh, delivery. Thirdly, uh, well, even though Peter said there's still room for improvement in terms of, uh, of water use and irrigation efficiency, there's certainly been uh, increased efficiency uh, in the market uh, uh, in terms of water use. So usually when you place a value on something, the, the uh, uh, stakeholders become more concerned how efficiently they, they use that asset. And the same goes with water. So which this has at least partly resulted in improved on-farm infrastructure, supported uh, 
by the Commonwealth uh, on farm grants and, and, and schemes to capture more water or reduce wastage. And all in all, farmers uh, are now more uh, strategic in their watering plans regarding timing and, and application rates and volumes. And lastly, there are more and more innovative water market products available for water right holders. Not just the regular spot market, but there are instruments around forward markets, carryover, leasing, uh, deferred delivery, and so forth. In fact, irrigators have never been better placed to act on the water market by using these uh, water market instruments. As a result of uh, increased maturity on the market side and also as a result of the policy reforms, there's been a notable change uh, in water trade patterns. And this is strictly about temporary uh, annual allocation trading. So whilst the markets were, uh, while the markets were immature, the pattern looked something like this. During the first quarter, the first quarter and a half, there was little temporary trading activity. Uh, the irrigators, they bought when they needed the water in the high water use uh, period. Uh, not much planning in place, quite ad hoc, by once a year when you need the water. So the prices peaked during uh, December, January period. And not much of a water portfolio, just a single entitlement was mostly used. And also, uh, as David said, the carryover mechanisms were still to mature. There was limited uh, uh, availability for carryover. And of course, when you buy water uh, during the peak period, the prices are higher and, and it's very expensive. Now, when the markets have matured, there's been a notable change in this pattern. Well, firstly, you'll see that the price peak, it's not as strong, not as obvious. It has softened. And this is because there's more strategy, more planning behind uh, the, the water management. Uh, people. They don't buy just once a year. They manage risk by doing multiple purchases throughout the year, or even buy this year's water uh, during the, the previous season using uh, carryover products and so forth. So it's all in all, it's more strategic uh, way of doing things. As mentioned, irrigators use uh, multiple entitlements in their portfolio, and also the availability of, of carryover uh, has has increased. So even though the price is still peak usually during uh, December and January, the tail end of the season, uh, it reacts to the outlooks for the upcoming season. So usually around this time of the year, the irrigation authorities, they start to publish outlooks for the next season uh, in terms of how much water is likely to be allocated for a, a specific entitlement, 1st of July, when the next season uh, starts. So if there's a dry year on the cards, the market sentiment is that next year there's going to be less water available, so the prices will be higher. So I'm better off buying water still during this year using carryover or forward contracts, and that's why the demand goes higher at the tail end of the current season, and so will the price. However, if there's a dry year on the cards, no, sorry, wet year on the cards, uh, the, the market sentiment is, quite, is the opposite, really. People think that uh, next year there's going to be a lot of water available. The prices will be cheaper. I don't need to engage with the market this year. And therefore, the demand goes down, and so will the prices. This figure, which is from uh, the data, is from uh, Murray Irrigation Limited in, in New South Wales Murray, and their uh, water exchange uh, uh, volumes and prices. It shows the same pattern. Uh, as the markets have matured, there's a greater engagement around the market. Uh, better awareness uh, to, to trade the unused water. So there's more water traded at a fairly similar prices than uh, pre-trout uh, conditions with less volatility. And these are all signs of maturing markets. One fact of the matter we, we have to face is that the amount of water available for consumptive use, it will not increase. All major systems have been fully allocated for quite some time. So you can't just apply for, for, a, for a license from the government and get X megaliters. Uh, well, David touched uh, on this topic uh, in his presentation uh, regarding the government holdings. So the Commonwealth uh, Environmental Water Office is the single largest water holder in Australia because they've recovered a lot of water uh, for the environment. 
uh, according to the basin plan. And uh, yeah, there have been some concerns that water recovered for the environment, it, it weakens the supply, constraints uh, uh, the supply side uh, for the farmers, and in the long run, the prices will increase. Well, as, as, as David mentioned, there's been some recent studies that uh, whilst there is uh, an impact, it's not the key, key driver, but it is actually the uh, total water availability in terms of announced allocations and, and prevailing climatic conditions. And this figure, it, it illustrates the same thing from the market size point of view. So even though we see on the green here, the Commonwealth has recovered a lot of water starting from 08, 09. Uh, it is the, the water availability, the blue bars over here, which are the announced allocations uh, uh, in the uh, Murray Darling Basin, that have a greater impact on the, on the volume of the, of the temporary water traded in the basin, which is the red line over there. This year, however, it seems to break this pattern a bit. Even though the water availability has doubled, basically, uh, the projected amount of trade in the, within the basin is only going to be slightly higher than, uh, than, than last year. Well, there's a logical explanation for this. This year, there's so much water available, not just in the southern basin, but also in the northern catchments, that the demand side is simply not there. People can get, get by with their uh, announced allocation, and they don't need to engage with the market uh, as much. Compared to last year when the supply side was the constraining factor in terms of market size, this year it's the demand side. Well, so far I've talked about market maturity from, from the temporary uh, market side of things, but there are clear signs of maturing uh, in the permanent market as well, especially in the sudden connected system. As an example here, we have the uh, temporary uh, price uh, graph for the Southern Connected System and the permanent water uh, prices for Victoria Murray Zone 7 high reliability entitlement. What this graph shows that even though there's been a quite dramatic drop in, in temp water prices in the uh, Southern Connected System from last year to this year, I mean last year they peaked uh, at around $300 meg. As we speak, temp water is traded in the Southern Basin, uh, Southern Connected Basin in the Murray system at at $45 per megaliter, and even, even lower in the Murray Bidji. In, in the Bidji, the water prices are below $20 per meg. So even though there's been a dramatic drop in the temp water price, the entitlement price uh, has, uh, the entitlements have, have kept their value. There's been little to, to no change at all uh, for the Vic Murray Zone 7 high reliability entitlement price. Uh, no volatility uh, at all, which is a sign of a, of a mature market. And what these strong prices for permanent water rights represent, it is the gains in the water productivity and the strength in the irrigation sector. And it shows that irrigators, they're adapting to water as an asset with an increased awareness of the value of that asset, which result in, results in better management and utilization of that asset uh, through greater engagement around the water markets. Well, even though the water markets in Australia, they're a core component of effective utilization of this scarce resource, it's not like we've uh, reached perfection. Uh, to enable the water, Australian water market to further mature, Water Fund considers that there are some actions needed to firstly improve water market information. At present, there is no focal, well-functioning nationwide water market information service. Well, I know that the, the, the bomb is about to release a new product, which may be a partial solution for this issue, but as we speak, there is no well-functioning uh, nationwide service available. Specifically, there is a lot of work to be done before the quality and tra transparency of Queensland water market information is brought to a level comparable to other basin states. For instance, there is no publicly uh, accessible free water register in Queensland. And in fact, Waterfine is the only provider for up-to-date water prices in Queensland. Secondly, uh, actions are needed to remo remove some impediments for lending against water rights, so-called water finance. There are issues in relation to accounting standards for water, 
and capital allocation models uh, for lending against water that need to be resolved in order to reach the full potential of water rights as an, as an asset class. And lastly, Water Fund considers that there's some room for improvement in regards to the transparency uh, uh, around Commonwealth environmental water holders' water portfolio management. It can be argued that uh, at present, the lack of transparency around that matter is distorting the water market in, in many ways. And more emphasis should be put on announcing the choose trading intentions as accurately as possible and actually avoid announcing anything if the details are, are too uncertain. The CHU should also consider engaging with the market as a silent participant uh, using the existing well-functioning market mechanisms instead of uh, off-market tenders. And this is an approach that, for instance, the Victorian Environmental Water Holder has chosen to do. They've acted on the temporary market this year as a silent participant. And it can be argued that that way it creates much less turmoil on the market. In fact, it doesn't have any sort of impact, which is the best way of, of going about it in terms of uh, 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 for a government uh, body to engage with the water market. I'm going to finish my presentation with a quote as well. Uh, this is from Professor John Briscoe from Harvard University, who stated that Australia did something which no other country could conceivably have managed. In a large irrigated agricultural economy, a 70% reduction in water availability had very little aggregate economic impact. This extraordinary achievement is, in my view, the single most important water fact of the 21st century, because it shows that it's possible to adapt to rapid climate change and associated water scarcity. I believe this summarizes the, the water market's role in the effective utilization of a scarce resource really well. Thank you.